Thank you. It doesn't matter if it's horizontal. Is it okay, horizontal? Yeah, it's or should perfect. I make it? It's better like it's okay? that. This this one is excellent. Yeah. Okay. All let right. me. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. Take your time. A... Take your time. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got something. To no charge worries. I'll that. wait for the dragon. No worries. Oh uh, well. Yo. Yes. Perfect. Mar martial artists have a have a, 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 a long history of not being very good with nerdy stuff because we went out and do other th other stuff like uh, I don't know meeting chicks, punching the bag, uh, getting you know, our protein. I, I will tell you what what my um, reasoning is on my helplessness to In do okay. anything. <laughs> I have had quote people. For years, all my whole life. I, I've never had a job. My last real job was I was a bartender and a manager of a nightclub. And that was in the early 70s. Wow, you were a bouncer That's as well? the last job I had. The other jobs I've had, when I'm on a movie set, there's a million people running around saying, See? Uh oh Everybody uh, wants the dragon. The other phone's gone. Now, how do I turn <laughs> that down? <laughs> pick it up, pick it up. Uh, 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 I'm not even gonna answer this thing. Uh, I I think it's Roger Corman. You got to pick it up. <laughs> what, what, oh shit! What is? <laughs> it's Chuck Norris now. No, if I, if it, that would pop up. It was some stranger that we don't know, and 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 I'm not gonna know. <laughs> but anyway i was saying yeah yeah, yeah. I, i've had people do everything for me literally I, I i when i was acting i had a personal manager entertainment attorney agent two assistants publicist um <laughs> well whole, i mean whole... all all on salary plus percentages wow okay you know yeah. and um yeah I knew I was doing something wrong when I went into my business manager and oh I, yeah entertainment attorney but anyway and I and he was talking about next year's contracts and he said <laughs> I I said well we should have plenty of money in there I, I said I, I did like three movies this year and he said well your overhead is 40,000 a month and I thought to myself what I I didn't I, I never totaled up anything that was costing me my overhead was 40,000 a month and all I was was I was just an actor that's it what? Wow, that's like <laughs> Janet Jackson's overhead, <laughs> like with a whole entourage. No, no, no. You know, you heard of the guy MC Hammer? Fresh new kicks and bands. You got it like that. Now you know you want to dance. So move out of your seat. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. MC can't touch okay. this. Okay, his overhead was four hundred thousand, four hundred thousand a month. Oh, four hundred thousand. Oh, uh, that month. is why he was broke because, after the right? It was well, like look, a, a one of the things story. he did was I. I did as well. When you first start making money publicly, because yeah. look, if I was a normal person and, and I start getting successful in my career, nobody would know about it, right? Nobody goes into your tax forms and checks out how much money you're making. But when you're like MC Hammer, they see him at the Grammys and they hear his mu music on the radio and they think, you know, he's rich. And everybody you know starts calling you wanting to borrow money. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's basically and not only that, but people like from a high school, and I did, I, I, I gave out a lot of money, you know, um, my inclination is to help people and people, I, I, I supposedly own property in Las Vegas. I have businesses I've started over. I've, I've, wow. uh, you know, I, yeah, money went out. Let's put it that way. When, when you've never really had money, then all of a sudden you have millions of dollars coming in. Uh -huh. it, 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 it's, um, <laughs> holding on to it's not easy yeah so it just shows you know? how generous you are but uh such crazy times though. no well, it wasn't Ro just me I, one of my friends was mickey rourke and i oh. went in there complaining to mickey rourke that i had made two million dollars like the year before and i i had none of it it was all gone i had no idea where it was and he looked at me like he was gonna punch me and he goes don 
He goes, I've made $20 million as an actor. He goes, I don't have a dime. I'm living on top of my gym. Oh, my goodness. And, and th this was <laughs> when Mickey Rourke in the 80s, w when I first met him. He was the shit. He was, he was, he was like one of the top up and coming actors. I mean, he had that movie. Uh, and I, and th when we would go out at night, all the girls would come to Mickey, you know, and I got his scraps. Um, <laughs> nine and a half weeks. He did a movie called Nine and a Half Weeks. Nine and half this weeks, shows yeah. you people, people are kind of crazy. They think what they see on the screen is you, how you really are. <laughs> He's nothing like that guy on Nine and a Half Weeks. How is he? How is he then? What, what's, what's deferring? I, I mean, you know yeah, what? Nine and a Half He's Weeks. The, is, yeah. He's the, let me tell you, he is the greatest friend, loyal, mm. you could ever have if you're a man. Okay. But, but I tell people, if I had a sister and Mickey Rourke was the one to go out with her, I'd have to kill him. <laughs> he's not good. I, I just don't think he treats his women with respect. Let's put it that way. Okay, okay, his okay. female relationships, he, he's, he's, he's not, and you know, it's not my business anyway. I don't, I don't no, care what no, somebody no, no, does no, to it, their wife or girlfriends. Or, it's not my business. But I'm just saying, as a guy, he's a very loyal friend. Mm, very nice. loyal friend. Nice, we had the nice. same boxing trainer. That's how we met. Mm, okay. When I first okay. moved to L.A., I got this boxing trainer in Watts named Bill Slayton, and uh -huh. he used to train Ken Norton. Yeah. And I, my first day in the gym, I met Mickey. Mickey was there the first day I went to the gym. Did he know who you, who you were back then? You know, I, I never asked him. I, <laughs> I, I never said, hey, when you met me, did you know? But he, he was introduced to me as this is a kickboxing champion. In fact, when I went to the boxing gym, he was in Watts. It's an all-black mm. gym. Wow. And um, I'm like closer to, closest thing to white there. <laughs> so I go in and the very first first day everybody wanted to spar me they hear oh kickboxing champions here basically what they want to do is and listen I I have no grudges against anybody for that because uh -huh. I've been having gym wars kickboxers and boxers traditionally in the 70s when I first started I started fighting professionally in 1974 mm -hmm. but in those days they'd never heard of it and they were trying they said oh he's a light heavyweight champion well I fought J.B. Williamson, who was the boxing light heavyweight champion. Um, oh, gosh. What was the other guy? He was Olympic uh, gold medalist, um, Henry Tillman. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I sparred both Henry Tillman and, and J.B. Williamson, the boxing champion. First day I was in the gym. I know the names. And these are not. Yeah. Well, these are not guys that I, I, I'd never met them before. But they're, no boxing champion is going to, like, baby you in the gym. Do you know what uh -huh. I mean? Yeah, it, yeah. In martial arts, we like to say, oh, we have control. Like, I can spar, and I do, right? <laughs> Most of the people I spar are women today because the <laughs> I train in the boxing gym, and the boxing trainer knows the pro boxers are going to hurt these girls that come in to learn boxing. So he lets them spar me because I can throw punches and spar and give them a workout without hurting them. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I, I, I have what we call in martial arts control. I, I can throw a hard kick or I can throw a soft kick. And... Um, I, I don't have to sacrifice uh, speed mm -hmm. for yeah. that, you know. I, I, because I don't, you have control. Um, because you have control. Yes, exactly. because I've trained as a martial arts. Well, well, that's one of the reasons people ask me what um, what the fight scene, fight scenes I did were like from being a professional fighter. And I told them, listen, I, when you're at the high le highest level of kickboxing, I, I have control over my punches and kicks. I know where they're going, how hard they're going, and. Um, I see things coming at me a little bit better than the average person, right? So when it came to fight scenes, it was very, I made the tra transition very quickly and easily and, you know, it wasn't like I went and trained with a bunch of stuntmen or anything. Yeah, they just yeah. told me what they wanted me to do, the choreographers, and I just did it. But I'm curious about something, which is, I think that I, as a stuntman, not that I'm, I'm not a real fighter, I'm a, a, a choreography fighter, okay? So I never yes. fought in the yeah. ring, and nor did I have any professional fights or even amateur fights for that matter. Uh, but I got, I gotten to, to know the fight choreography very well, and we all, we all know uh -huh. that uh, the movements have to be a lot more flashy, a lot more ample movements, bigger oh, movements. Of course, yeah. That's why wushu I can't and taekwondo are great for that. Did you feel at any time that you were getting some sort of um, uh, bad, like bad addiction to movements, to bigger movements that might have hurt you in the ring when all you want to be is more direct and more efficient? Well, you know, it's, it's like this. And I tell people, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. Um, I was in high school when I 
was it um, athlete in high school. I was the MVP of the high school football team, and I was the MVP of the high school basketball team I attended. That's insane. And those are two totally different sports. There's no connection between basketball and football. Basketball, you can't even touch them. Football mm-hmm. was a middle linebacker. It was my job to oh. demolish the other side. Yeah. You know, they put Tackle. me right in the middle. I was a defense captain. I was the MVP as a, as a middle linebacker. You know, usually the MVP is the quarterback or a wide receiver, somebody who scores. But I, I, well, I literally, I scored two touchdowns as a defensive player. That's pretty unusual. Wow. Um, oh, wow. I just took the ball away from him, you know, and just ran touchdowns. So, but, but the so point is, by fumble or by, by interception. From early on. <laughs> By fumble or interception? I was an athlete from early on, and I was able to adapt from one sport to the other. Yeah. Basically, I, I weighed 205 when I was, uh, I guess I was 16 years old. I was a senior in high school, and I had to drop all that weight when basketball season came because oh, there's heavy. no such thing as a – yeah, but it was all solid muscle. I mean, mm-hmm. I ran a 4840, oh. and I did uh, – people said, well, how much was your bench? And I, uh, You know, weightlifters. And I said, well, mm-hmm. I did 315. I did five sets of five. What? Which is considered – Pretty decent. That, but that was my bench um, when I was in high school. <laughs> well, that's strong as hell. That's so, not decent. That's strong as hell. I would very much struggle to do well, one repetition I, with that. <laughs> I had many scholarships. I ended up going to the Coast Guard Academy. But I had many football scholarships, basketball scholarships. Um, I, I went to the Coast Guard Academy, though, because it, my year was the Vietnam era. It was 1972. Mm. And all my friends were going to Vietnam. And uh, my brother's draft number was two. So my older brother was was gonna go he he he, he was on his way uh-huh. and uh you know basically what happened was i went to the coast guard academy so i wouldn't have to go to vietnam oh, and okay. um uh all the deduct all, all the uh, um uh deferments were gone for guys un- unless you're donald trump i mean you get five of them <laughs> but um uh you if you don't have money you, you get your letter and you either go to jail or you go to vietnam mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um even to this day you know uh it was the right decision not to go to Vietnam. I mean, that country, ne- I don't want to get political, but that country mm-hmm. never killed one American person. Mm-hmm. We went to war with them because uh, it made a lot of money for a lot of companies in America. Literally. And, you know, and I remember I mean, the, the it, whole controversy with Muhammad Ali not going and he's saying, oh, no, no Viet, no Viet <laughs> Cong ever called me a Negro. <laughs> I refuse to be inducted into the United States uh, Army. Right? So, no, listen. He, he, he gave an interview, mm. and he, I'm a big Ali fan. I, I've seen every documentary. Oh, he me pointed too. at the audience of reporters, and he said, if I was going to fight somebody that did something, he said, I'd fight all y'all. He said, no Vietnamese <laughs> didn't do anything. He said, it's all these American white people that exactly. did something to his people. Yeah. And, but anyway, I, I, I did not, I did not um, want to go to Vietnam, so I went to Coast Guard Academy. So that's why I didn't go. But here's what ends up happening. I, we got out of Vietnam after a year. So I, after one year of the Coast Guard Academy, I got out of the academy. I, I did something that's uh, it's probably hardly ever been done. In well, fact, I was told by the athletic director that it can't be done. But I started a sport at the collegiate level. They did not have a football team. The basketball team was already picked at the junior college. And I said, well, what other sports do you have? And he said, we have wrestling. But these are all state national champions. You can't start wrestling at the collegiate level. You're for, you know, like imagine this. You've never touched a basketball, and you want to go out for the basketball team at a college university. Ouch. Ouch. But, no. That, okay. That, that... Well, I walked onto the wrestling. I said, I want to try out. So the coach said, okay, well, you know, here's my 190-pounder. Let me just see if you can give him a workout. And he could see instantly that I was an athlete. Mm. Even though I didn't know what I was doing, I just said, okay, well, how, how does the sport work? What, what am I supposed to do? You know, And um, I got a wrestling scholarship. He, he actually, I, I had a, I was, I was supposed to go there. I, I, I'm sure he thought I was just going to quit the first day. But, but after two weeks, he gave me a full scholarship, and I took fourth in the state of Florida at 177 my second year. So I was the fourth best wrestler. And actually, the guy who beat me um, went to nationals the year before. Oh, man. So maybe I would have gone to Nationals if I didn't have to wrestle him because he was the best guy in Florida. That's incredible. And, uh, I had, but I did take, I took fourth place. So I went from never wrestling to fourth in the state of Florida, and I was on my way. I'm sure I would have gone to the Nationals, maybe even done well if I had stuck with wrestling. But what happened was that's right when I started kickboxing. Huh. So uh, were you, you were know, you... the training of striking is not like the training of grappling. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You know, it's were, totally were you, different. Were you genetically gifted already from the get-go as a child? Did, did anybody notice anything? Or or was it well, the actual sports and the good mentorship or, or coaching that you had, I don't know, at 10, 12 years old? Well, there's a saying in sports, and it's um, – I don't know if it's 100% true. I don't think it is 100% mm -hmm. true. But they say athletes are not created. They're born. Uh -huh. You know, champions. Excuse me. Champions. And because there's when you get to the top, let's say, 1% of kickboxers, um, there's very little difference between us. Speed, strength, um, flexibility, or, you know, it, it's – and we all have – or this exact same weight, right? When I fought light heavyweight, it's 175. So what is it that makes one guy win 11 world, I won 11 world titles under three different sets of rules, you know, uh, because there, there were, the, you know, kickboxing is not like boxing, you know, where the rules are the same all over the world all, all the yeah. time. The rules were different, you know, and um, I, I was able to adapt. It, it, you know, they, I would sign a contract and I'd train for six weeks and I'd do, a, I'd do Muay Thai in Bangkok. Um, then six weeks later, I'd be fighting Johnny Terrio, the best puncher kicker in the, what they call full contact style. I mm -hmm. fought him in Montreal. Um, I would go, that's probably what separated me, but, but I was able to adapt. And I think, you know, I, I was born with a certain, it was the sport I was born to do, mm -hmm. uh, martial arts, punching and kicking. And if they'd had MMA, if they had the grappling, uh, since I took to co collegiate wrestling, having never done it, I, I've done some training in, in jiu-jitsu, and I'm, I'm sure I would pick that up just as fast. Yeah. I would have been yeah. great at some, I believe. I, I believe um, you'd been, you so would have been great at MMA. I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. I think it's a combination. Um, because a lot of people said, why did I gravitate to sports? Why, why did I push myself as a high school athlete to become MVP of my football and basketball team? And it was because I grew up in the South and – in, in America in the Florida is considered the South mm -hmm. and it was during segregation. They had white schools and black schools. So they didn't put me in the black school. They put me in the white school, mm -hmm. but I was like the only Asian in the state of Florida. Oh, <laughs> I mean, okay. Asians don't come. This was in the fifties when I first moved to Florida. And so I, I look very Asian and even more so when I was, and um, I wanted to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And I found yeah. out early on, that if you sink a 30 foot jump shot, everybody loves you. Oh, <laughs> the yeah. white guys like you, the black guys. And, and when they, my first year of high school was a historic period of American uh, history. That was the first year they desegregated the schools. Oh. They put black people and white people in the same school. So what you had is you had a whole bunch of black guys on one side and a whole bunch of white guys. And it turned out whenever there's a basketball game, you know, a pickup game, it was uh -huh. white against black. That's what, it, and then where would I go though? But what ended up happening was <laughs> I was so good, all yeah. the black guys would say, hey, Wilson, you're not white, be on our side. So I go play yeah. on the black team. <laughs> then the white guys would go, Wilson, you, you're, you're not black, hey, get, get, come on our team. And so I would go back and forth. And uh, I like to tell people now, because I've given a lot of speeches on, uh, on anti-bullying and things. I said, I turned a negative into a positive. I turned what is normally negative prejudice mm -hmm. into a positive. I excelled in um, the sports because of the something that was negative that I was not accepted, but I wanted to be accepted. So I pushed myself probably a little harder than the other guys. My incentive was to feel, you know, um, like I belonged to some right? group. Uh -huh. Accepted, correct. But yeah. but I'll say this: by the time I was eighteen, by the time I started martial artists, uh, I, martial arts, that was all behind me. I was accepted. I was. I had none of that as motivation in martial arts. In martial arts, it was just um, to me. I looked at it as a sport in the beginning. So just studying martial arts. After a couple of years, I, I they had started full contact, and my brother asked me if I would fight. He wanted to promote the very first full contact karate. Is what they called it then, not kickboxing. The very first fights in the state of Florida. And uh, he asked me if I'd fight in it. And I said, yes. And um, people asked me, did I like him to be, I, first of all, I lost my first fight. And I broke my hand in the fight. So I had to get it set and I didn't get paid enough. 
there was no sanctioning bodies or nothing. So it cost me money and I lost and I loved it. Oh. And, um, of course, you know, uh, I, I didn't intend to be a professional fighter. I was just going to fight a few fights and just see how it went, but I ended up fighting for 28 years. And if you do anything for 28 years, you better be either good. Somebody's at it. got a gun. <laughs> that means you have passion. Or you really like it. <laughs> you really like it. <laughs> and I really loved kickboxing. In fact, I, you know, I, I had a fight offered two years, yeah, two years ago and I accepted it, but my opponent wouldn't fight. So the fight didn't happen, but I will still fight. I'm, I'm so crazy. Look, Tyson's going to fight Roy Jones, right? Oh yeah. 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 Pay-per-view is so big that the money they're offering me is unbelievable. Like, I was the uh, the fight they offered me was in Kazan, which is part of Russia. Actually, it's because it's Kazan, yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, it was the owner of this huge. He's a Russian billionaire. He owns a huge uh, stadium, and it was like when Ali fought Frazier in the Philippines. Oh. He wanted to just promote the fight to to get publicity for his stadium and and himself. You know, uh, Marcos got in the ring with Ali and Frazier, and the whole world knew who. Marcos was just, he's the president of the Philippines. Hmm. No, who's the president today? Nobody knows him. Oh, <laughs> I've never no. heard of the president of the Philippines. But you know what? He, that guy was the most famous president in the world right after the Ali Frazier. Yeah, they made him famous. The thriller so, in Manila. So that's the same thing. This guy knows if I fight, you know, it's it's not that a great they don't consider me a great kickboxer. I'm 65. If I fight, it's like a freak show. It's like everybody would watch it to say, well, how good could he be? Let's see. You know, it's like a carnival show, a 65 year old kickboxer, you know, fighting 10 rounds. Um, uh, but I, you, not for me, I'm saying for the public, it's, it's, it's like, um, yeah, they don't know. They don't uh, know. They don't, they don't feel what you feel, yeah, right? Nobody knows. It's never been done. It's never yeah, been done. And exactly. Look, I was with Mayweather last year. The president of uh, Chechnya invited mm. me, um, uh, Floyd Mayweather and Mark Nikoskis to his birthday party. Oh, I so, love Mark. We all three went. We all three went to the. He's a big fight fan. The, 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 the president of uh, Chechnya, <laughs> and so we all went to his party. And you know, um, Floyd. <laughs> it's got to be weird going we, to the the, the birthday I, I don't party want to of the. I don't beans, but I know the real story of the Conor McGregor thing. But anyway, Floyd <laughs> made two hundred million. Conor made one hundred million. That's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Yeah. Two hundred million he made in one fight. Now. It, <laughs> what does your family say? Money always complains about taxes, but even after taxes, he's walking <laughs> away with <laughs> a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah, like a, a great yeah. pension for like four generations. For, for, look, look, look! I'm gonna explain something to you. Look, I'm a pro fighter. I watched that fight. Uh -huh. If you want to call it a fight. Oh yeah. Well, what what did show. you think? What did you think? Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Conor McGregor is an athlete, exceptional athlete. Yeah. He trains hard. He's in great shape. He started his fighting as an amateur boxer. Now, he was a horrible amateur boxer. Not to say horrible, but he's not an Olympic champion. He's not a professional contender. He's not, he was just a local guy in Ireland doing a little boxing. You know, it's like Golden Gloves boxing in America, okay? That's the level of his boxing now. And that's all he did. Because he, MMA is not boxing. Do you know what I mean? But exactly. even as an amateur boxer, he learned how to throw a straight, left and he knew how to avoid a little bit you know the head movement things so the striking ability of the mma guys are so low compared to even amateur boxers that he was able to compete and beat them he knocked a lot of guys out i, I don't think he was very good at, at, at choking guys, guys out i mean uh he you know i only saw a few of his fights but he was not great as a grappler yeah as a grappler you know? everybody has that uh, that so look when i when I, I i saw the promo for him and habib mm -hmm. and just the promo, I said, Connor might catch him with a punch, but if he doesn't, if he goes to the ground, Habib's going to choke him out. Yeah. Because yeah. there's no competition. You know, just having been a collegiate wrestler, when I see guys m moving, I, I can I can almost predict the outcome, how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, at least to the extent of this. One guy has the advantage on the ground. Do you know what I mean? Like, some, yeah. anybody can make a mistake, but for sure, Habib was light years ahead of conor mcgregor on the ground um even his striking was very can beat mcgregor 
Even his striking was very good. I yeah, mean, he, his stand-up fighting was very good. He, he, it's like he was trying to beat Conor at, at his own game. He only went for the for the grappling later on, which which I found that well, uh, was look, look, very entertaining. I'm, I'm getting a little sidetracked because we're really talking about Conor McGregor and um, Mayweather. So, but here's the thing: it's okay, no worries. Mayweather is a master boxer, a great boxer, and yes, he was 47 years old, way past his prime. Way, mm -hmm. past, you know, you. Your prime as a boxer is in your late twenties, probably. Yeah. Early thirties. That that your your best years. Um, so he's forty seven years old. He he said in the pre fight interviews, he said, "Look, I, I'm not the man I was in my prime." He goes, "But I'm plenty for you." <laughs> and here's the thing: he got rid of Bob Arum. He promoted himself. That's how he got the two hundred million. Yeah. Because normally they do it like this: you gross three hundred million, the promoter makes a hundred million, you make a hundred million. And your opponent makes a hundred million. That's how they split it up on this pay per view, usually. Yeah. But for him, he gave Conor McGregor a hundred million, and he pocketed two hundred million. And um, here's what he had to do, though: he had to carry McGregor and put up a fight. He didn't want, because I think he he wanted to do more of those, which he did. You know, he did another pay per view show in Japan mm -hmm. right after that, and not pay per view for. Not, it, it was a show in Japan. It was supposed to be like an exhibition thing. He knocked out the Japanese guy in one round, laughing the whole way. And that guy was a much better uh, striker than Conor McGregor. So okay. I, you want my opinion? If he had wanted to put Conor McGregor away early, he could have easily. Okay. But he let him go the whole fight. And in the end of the fight, the only thing that got hard for him, and it's a funny thing, but it would be hard for anybody. Conor McGregor was so stunned. He was stumbling. He did the thing we used to, we call him, Martial arts, drunken monkey style. <laughs> if you're falling around, look, if you're falling around, you don't know where you're going to fall. The other, how can the other guy predict where you're going to fall? <laughs> and yeah. so Conor McGregor was bouncing off the ropes. He was stumbling forward. He, he was, and, and when Mayweather decided you know, it didn't really occur to him that he'd have to chase him down to, you know, get a good one planted on him. Yeah. McGregor was leaning back and falling. If you just watch the last round, you'll see it, it wouldn't be easy for anybody to knock him out because he was stumbling around so much. <laughs> you couldn't predict what, where he was going to go. So the referee ended up, you know, Connor was obviously not defending himself or firing back anything. <laughs> so the stumbling. referee just stopped the fight. Yeah. But it, it let Connor get out of the thing with respect you know he he went nine rounds with mayweather you know yeah, and yeah look, that's just a lot of cardio a lot of heart I, yeah. i'll tell you what the fight was supposed to be and i would have done the same thing the fight was supposed to be with van damme that's the fight offer i got now oh, your your fight John against van damme? van damme my john claude van damme has never to my knowledge even had one pro kickboxing match oh, but he yeah. lies and he says Oh, I'm I'm 18 and one, and I'm world a former champion. European world champion. Oh, mm. well, you know what? There's no such thing as a European world champion, right? I mean, <laughs> the world is the earth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not the American world champion. I, I'm a world champion. I, you're anyway. Go on YouTube and punch Don the Dragon Wilson. You come up with the town fights. Wow, yeah, uh, I just saw. A you couple. go up with Chuck Norris. Put Chuck Norris's name. You're gonna get a bunch yeah. of fights. Um, any, any pro fighters got fights. Now, Van Dam claims he was a world champion. Where's his fights? Who did he fight? Mm. Where, where's his opponent? Wouldn't these guys be getting interviewed? Hey, how how is Van Dam? And, and you know how how fast was he? There there are no opponents. There yeah. are no promoters. There's no television. There's no YouTube fights of his. He said he was a world champion. We fight twelve rounds. Mm -hmm. Show me one 12 round fight on YouTube for Van Dam. It's all lies. So anyway. Here's what I was going to do. And this was, is not me saying uh, the promoter wants me to. But I would let him have, I wouldn't just knock him right out. I, I would let him have where he could throw some kicks, take him a few rounds, work his body a little bit, like like Mayweather did. To I make it entertaining. Respectable. I, right. I would not just let the bell ring and my mindset is take him out as soon as I could. Because I could get inside and he would go out in one or two rounds for sure. Yeah. You know, the guy's never had a pro fight. I'm not bragging about that. There's no bragging for any pro fighter. No, it's like... It's, people ask me, what would the fight be like? The fight's like... Me fighting Van Damme is like Tyson fighting Stallone. 
Exactly. Yeah. Stallone looks great in the movie. Great example. Great he example. He looks great yeah. in the movies. Yeah. And he's fit. He and damn looks great in his movies, and he's fit. He's in shape. He's got muscles. I mean, he's done a lot of cocaine, so he's. I don't believe he's got. His core is not the same as mine. You know, let me, mm. I tell you, I, I you know, I, I, I'm one of the keynote speakers at the biggest anti-aging convention in the world, and my anti-aging didn't start. I didn't start doing the things that I do now until I was in my 40s. When I came out of retirement, I was 45 then. Uh -huh. And I I have, a, that was 20 years I've been on vitamin, mineral, protein supplements. I rebuilt my entire body. Every injury I have is gone. That's one of the reasons why I feel like fighting. And a matter of fact, a bizarre thing, it's not supposed to happen, but my eyesight is 20, 20. I don't wear glasses anymore. I wore glasses my entire life. When I was 18 years old, I couldn't see anything. I had a, I, my driver's license, the last one I got has no restrictions. In my sixties, my eyes corrected themselves. Well, do, do you? I do did you, nothing uh, except I. So, I've been on vitamin and mineral supplements for twenty years. So that's what you attributed to uh, the 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 the, the uh, yes. richness of nutrients yes. that you put in your body every day, like the micronutrients. Yes, and you're never gonna you're never gonna hear that from any ophthalmologist. But go on the line. <laughs> no, the, no. The odd thing is this: I did not get on the vitamin and mineral supplements because of my eyesight. I got on them because when I came out of retirement, I was in such pain. I had a bad shoulder. I was told I needed a hip replacement and I had hurt my knee doing a stunt in a movie. You know, for 28 years, all every kickboxer in America tried to take my, that I fought, tried to take out my right knee because that's my kicking leg. Oh, and I got away scot-free. I ended my career without ever getting my right knee injured. So I'm doing a stunt in one of my stupid movies and I jump out of a tree and I land on the ground and there's, I didn't know it. Because I'm not a professional stuntman. I should have checked the ground. Uh -huh, there was uh -huh. a root of a tree under uh, like some dust, some dirt. And I landed on that root. And when my, when I hit the ground, this is what I heard. I, it was so loud. The stunt coordinator said, hey, did you hear that? I said, yeah, that was my knee. And your knee is not supposed to make any sounds. <laughs> and I never went to the doctor or anything. For years, it was hurting. Now it's pretty good, but the reason I don't go is because I'm from the era that guys go in and get under the knife for injuries for sports and they come back worse. And I know that's that's the that that is the 60s 70s attitude. But today they have everybody tells me no, Don. <laughs> that's like ancient history. It, it, it's today the doctors go in there, they see what they're doing, they know it. He said they can fix your knee, they can fix your hip, but everything healed on its own. But and, the weird thing is, and yeah, you fighters laughing. have a, they made you related. And you fighters have a big problem, which is here. You're so iron willed that it's like you can endure pain like I've never seen before. And I'm a stunt man. So I would say some some people would call it stubbornness. I think it's iron will, right? Uh I'm not sure, but I know this. They did a movie called Raging Bull. Yeah, oh yeah. And it was Robert uh, De Niro. and De Niro. And it's, a, it's about Jake LaMotta, and it's about the qualities that made him a great boxer, the stubbornness, the, the toughness, made him, he, he lived his life like normal life, and it ruined his life. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the things you do in the ring are, that, that doesn't work in real life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it ruins you, basically. Ruins your life. And um, It's too intense. So I'm not sure. Uh, you know, you could be right. My stubbornness and all kinds of other weird things, but um, and maybe I'm the only guy that can take vitamin, minerals, and supplements and stuff and, and heal everything. But I have no pain in my. I'm totally pain free. And just think of this: I came out of retirement the last time I was 45. I fought for three more years, won three more fights. Um, everything was in pain. If you watch my movies in the 90s, you're seeing a stunt man, me, because I'm doing my own stunts, my own fight scenes. In pain, every I would wake up lower back pain, um, knee, hip, shoulder. My right shoulder, when I raised up like this, it used to make popping sounds. Um, and that's pretty normal. But a lot of boxers they say Sugar Ray Leonard can't raise his hand, he plays tennis, but he can't raise his hand up, uh, to hit the ball. 
but um, it's common injuries. You know, all fighters end up with a lot of injuries. So how do you keep but, yourself in terms of mindset? Uh, if you don't mind me interrupting you, how do you keep yourself from going crazy, like going all out? Because sometimes you got to stop yourself a little bit. Do you have any sort of meditation, concentration, uh, uh, work? Uh, um, do you have any daily rituals that you might want to share? Yeah, the answer to that is yes, and it, but it's this. It's not... I used to be asked all the time, do you meditate? And I used to say no. But mm. then I realized when I'm running, I would run, you know, during my career from 74 to 84, I ran a six to nine miles every single day on the beach. So I'm running in, in, in the soft sand too, you uh -huh. know? So it's like, it where really works your calves. And I remember that I, all I did while I was running was think about all the things I was going to do to my opponent. I never thought about him ever laying a glove on me or kicking me. I only constantly... Hold it. I got to let this dog out of my office. <laughs> it Hold sounded on. like someone, somebody yeah, was I'll chopping right an back. onion. It's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Bring the dog. The let me meet the dog. <laughs> uh, well, one is a, a Labrador and a, it's huge. And the other one is a, a Shih Tzu. And, uh, oh, man. Sorry what about they, that, guys. What I, are I, their I, names? Uh, Sandy and uh, Angel. Sandy and uh, Angel? The dragon has Sandy and Angel for dogs? I, I thought you were going to have like Bruce Lee and, uh, I don't know, Real no, McCoy. <laughs> I didn't name them. Look, they, look they, 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 these dogs, my, my wife got both dogs. She went and got the dog. <laughs> I figured. One of them is a retired, uh, the Labrador is a retired seeing eye dog. So it's a service dog. Mm. And uh, it's, you know, so people don't get fooled like, by the name. Well, yeah, Sandy, I... Is so well trained. These they they claim she had seventy thousand dollars worth of training. I don't know who got paid seventy thousand to train a dog, but that <laughs> sounds like a pretty good job to me. But um, they asked me, does she bite? And I said, look, I'm more likely to bite than her. <laughs> she's better. I she's better trained than me. Um, but anyway, um, for, does, where, where were we? I can't remember what the your, question was. Now. Um, uh, speaking of of your family, speaking of your wife, does your family look at your ideas of uh, every once in a while saying maybe I'll go back to the ring? How do they look at that? Do do they say like, come on, it's it's come take it easy, let's relax, let's do a little yoga, <laughs> or are they like, uh, okay, go well, in, I'll be praying for you, I'll be there right right beside you. I was my I went and met my wife. She was a makeup artist, so I met her on my third film, hmm. and I was no longer fighting then. You know, I, my my concentration was film. If I took a fight, it was only because I, you know, couldn't resist it. The money was too good to say no. Exactly. And so I, but but my mindset was not. I was fighter of the year in 1984. That, that was my prime year, 1984. So by the time I was doing the movies, it was a 1988 was my first movie, Blood Fist. But by the time I was really full-time actor uh, in the 90s and doing, I would do up to five movies in a year. Um, when my wife met me, I was done with the fighting. She, she didn't really know anything about, you know, she, she's not a martial artist. She's a makeup artist. Oh, okay. So she knows about the movie business, the entertainment business. Um, she's an Emmy award winning. Excuse me. I better not forget that. <laughs> wow. Congrats. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, so she's really good. And, and uh, she didn't know that part of my life and I didn't experience it, but I get a fight offer. I, I get, um, you know, uh, now that I got rid of both my assistants, by the way, you know, all, all these people that I used to have, when you get one wife, they all go away. <laughs> <laughs> she said, she said, what do your assistants do? I said, well, they return my phone calls, they answer my mail, they do blah, blah, blah. She goes, you can do all that yourself. Get rid of both of them. And then she goes, well, what does your publicist do? I said, well, you know, he, he sets up interviews and she goes, well, you can do all that stuff yourself. Yeah. So basically what happens is you, 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 you lose all your people, <laughs> but you know, the good, the good thing is this, this, there's some guidance for you. There's some guidance for you before buying, you know, so I, we, I, we did buy this house, but, <laughs> but I, I would always lease homes. And I told her, listen, I, I, I'm not a guy. I don't like to buy houses. I, I bought one house in Florida and I held on to it. I didn't even live in the thing. Then I sold it. You know, I said, I, I don't um, buy homes. I just lease them. And, and she said, no, you should buy one. So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to support you. You buy it. So she finds a house and I buy it. Now I'm told it's doubled in value. It's, it, it's, it's what, what can you buy and use for 20 years? And it's worth twice as much the day you bought it. Wow. I mean, it, it was a great, great thing. I'm glad now that she, um, you know, 
She convinced you. Convinced me to buy a home instead of just <laughs> leasing them. Nice. You know? How, so you've you've probably had a lot of mentors. Uh, speaking of your wife, she was indeed a mentor by guiding you into oh, doing yeah, such good choices. Oh, yeah, she did more about the movie industry than I did. Yeah, and, and yeah. putting you on, on softer mode maybe because, you know, as a guy, as a fighter, maybe you sometimes you want it to go the hard way. So they're, they're always very good for that, that balance that we're looking for. And uh, I know that one of your first uh, references was or is your brother because he was the one who started you in the martial arts. Yep. But you started out with Kung Fu, right? Uh, no, I started out in Goju because oh, I was Goju. still in the Coast Guard Academy. Mm, okay. Yeah, Goju Ru. Uh, I started with Japanese karate under a guy named Chuck Merriman, mm -hmm. and that was in uh, uh, New London, Connecticut. It was in Connecticut, and um, yeah, I studied. That, it was it was the martial arts at the academy. That's why. And then when I came to Florida, people said uh, when I left the academy, uh, "Oh, so you thought kung fu was better than karate?" And I said, "No. If I wanted to study goju, I'd have to pay for it. But my brother's a kung fu instructor, so I can go to his school for free." Mm, so okay. that's why I, I studied Tai Lung Kung Fu. Now, as it turned out, it was a very open, very good style of Kung Fu. And um, I'm very glad that I did study it. But it, it's not the key to my success. I mean, you know, I don't believe, I'm, I believe I'm the, although, you know, Cynthia Rothrock studied Tai Lung Kung Fu as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think she's done pretty good as well. I mean, she was undefeated for five years as a uh, forms competitor. And then she's had a great career. But that's just a coincidence. She studied Pai Lam and I studied Pai Lam and we both ended up excelling in our own way. Because um, it was, like I said, a very open style. And, and that that wasn't open style. I mean this. The master, grandmaster was still alive. His name is Daniel K. Pai. And he said, any technique that works is the right technique in that, during, in, in that instance. Mm -hmm. In other words, he didn't care if it was from a different style. He he kind of loosely study everything, and if it works for you, and that's the the key, uh, it's things that might work for me might not work for you as a martial artist, and you should not incorporate or or spend your life trying to incorporate it into your style. The Don Wilson side kick, you know, which is really a back kick turned sideways. Uh, <laughs> it works for me, but maybe it won't work for you. And if it doesn't, you shouldn't try to do it. You know, yeah. people shouldn't do that. Styles aren't, you know, Bruce Lee said, I'm all styles, no style. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be restricted to one style. He wanted to be open to all styles. So um, that was his, that was revolutionary in his day. But today that's the way everybody thinks, right? We think about mixing the martial arts, studying everything. And then not everybody is more of a grappler. And, you know, we all have our own, Uh, Bruce Lee called it our, your own personal style. Study yeah. everything so that you're not ignorant of it. You know, you, you've got a choice of, like, if you don't study how to throw a left hook, you can't say, hey, I don't like left hooks. If it doesn't work for you after a, a, a trying and trying, then you say, you know what? I'm not going to go with that as much. I'm going to be more of a right cross or a jab or uppercut. So, so you believe, so you believe, believe everybody... That, um, So you believe that that everybody should start with a with a basis, with a foundation, like with a single style, and then Correct. progress onto others. Traditional style, and stu and study as much of everything you can. I, I worked out with taekwondo guys. I worked out with boxers. Mm. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of cross mm. training back in the days when it was not supposedly what you're supposed to do. But I, I was being a Bruce Lee fan. You know, he was in the early '70s, late '60s. He was preaching to mix the martial arts. Look. The opening of Enter the Dragon, he's fighting Sam Hung. He yep. submits him. Yep. And, you know, Arm the ball. gloves the UFC wears where you can grab and punch, he invented them. I mean, those are, those are the Jeet Kune Do style. There was yeah. nothing like that before. Mm -hmm. Boxers didn't, couldn't grapple, and grapplers didn't punch each other, you know. And um, he was kind of like our Einstein, I like to say, that Bruce Lee was, you know, ahead of his time. And, and today, with our theories and with our sports and our You know, um, we're just catching up to him today. Here I am, you know, as, as a human being. How can I express myself totally and completely? Now, that way, you won't create a style because style is a crystallization, you know? I mean, that way, it's a process of continuing growth. So, so if you had, he was teaching. so if, if you pick up a kid who's five or six years old and you want to put him in some martial arts, 
for your preference specifically, and I know that probably this answer can open a lot of uh, a lot of fields, but uh, or or might, there might be like a hundred different answers, and they all can be correct. But for for Don uh -huh. the Dragon Wilson, which martial art would you put that child into? Uh, well, you know, it, it's not the art; it's the instructor. It, it, it's the instructor. It, it, you know, it, it's not excellent, excellent, uh, excellent. For me, it's, yeah. it's 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 not um, a specific style. I, I you'd uh -huh. have to line up the instructors, and, and I, I would pick the one that I feel is the most conducive to that person. And 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 you know, it depends on the person that's looking for it. Like, if you want to be a competitor, you're 22 years old and you're in shape, and you say, you know what, I saw a karate tournament. I want to I want to win karate tournaments certain instructors would be more adept at teaching you than others. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not saying one is better, better than the other because they're just, I, I have more experience in that, that way. Like, let's just say, I used to have a pylon Kung Fu school. Let's say you wanted to learn how to be a kickboxer. Do you think my school would be a good one to go to? <laughs> I mean, Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm teaching kung fu, though, right? It's oh, okay. You mean the style, the but, but the person? I was thinking about the person. Boxing. Yeah, I was thinking about the person. Yeah. How yeah. <laughs> and, and the fact that I've got experience as a kickboxing exactly, champion, exactly. You know? um, but if you're just looking for self-defense, or you're just looking to stay fit, or you're, if there's other things you're looking for, there's a lot of people that can probably do it better than me. Like I can't say I was a great teacher of children. You know, matter of fact, I'm kind of a bad instructor when it comes to kids. Really, why? When I teach seminars, if you want to say a seminar that I enjoy, it's not teaching 150 kids at one time. You know, five year olds and ten year olds. It's teaching two or three high level kickboxers that are, let's say, they're 22 years old. He just broke into the top 10. Okay. And he's knocking guys out, but he can't figure out how to get this combination right and he's having a problem with his training at this level or he's getting tired in later rounds he wants to know what he can do oh. and I the information I could give him is information that only I can I'm like one of a top one percent that would be able to give him the right information mm -hmm. and if as an instructor it feels I feel more useful when I'm given instructions that I'm the only one that can really one of the only ones. I don't want to say the only ones because there's a lot of great kickboxers mm -hmm. out there. And um, so the refinement. But we all have our own. The refinement coming yeah, from the experience like polishing, that only. It's like polishing a, a marble statue. Uh huh. You know, I don't want to take a block of marble, just a square block, mm -hmm. and carve it into David. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the kind of that would, if you already have talent, you carve something and it almost looks like David, but there's a couple of things that are wrong. And I'm, let's say, a master, I'm Michelangelo, let's say, right? Uh -huh. okay. And I can tell yeah. you how to make the, the eyes look more real and how to get the hair the right way. And it, it's, it, I think Dundee was that kind of a boxing trainer. He was what mm. they call a finisher. He would take yeah. like an Olympic champion, Leonard, Leonard, and mold him and become a professional world champion welterweight. I don't know how Angelo Dundee would like to get 10 kids in a room and teach them. It's the first day they've ever put on hand wraps. Yeah. Okay. And he's got to treat, teach them how to be boxers. Do you know what I mean? But perfectly. He, perfectly. Okay. Well, that, that, that's me. No, but that's, I, that's so, I, I tell you, I, that is so such a, a personality trait, right? And it's, it's such a, it's, it's according to your experience, what you prefer to do. So, I, I believe it's better to do yeah. what we what we are set up to do. And it's not that you couldn't teach kids, obviously, but you feel better or you prefer to do that refinement. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, if it's gonna, it's more satisfying for me uh -huh, uh -huh. to teach yeah. high level. I like to be around a bunch of kickboxers and and believe me, we we talk almost. Um, it's almost like nonverbal communication. Uh -huh. You already you know. know. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's really, uh, straight right like i can tell if they're not shifting their weight correctly Properly. yeah when they throw punches and kicks it's something that other people don't even know what they're doing or they're not getting their hip into it uh -huh. like it, it's a fine line yet yeah, their hip you can you got to use 
the power, I tell people, the power comes from the floor. And most people don't understand this. The floor is just sitting there. I said, yes, that's where the power is. It goes through your legs, your body, up to your hips, to your shoulders. It's only delivered through the fist when you throw the punch. The power doesn't come from the hand. Don't look at the hand and think, oh, it's, I got to do something with my hand. It's all the other, you, you, you know, it, it's... Um, it's a kinetic chain. I, yes. Yeah. Well, look, Babe Ruth, American baseball, I don't know how familiar, uh -huh. but, but Babe Ruth was, hit a lot of home runs. The guy looks like a butter, but he's got a big gut. No, <laughs> it doesn't look like he's got a muscle in his body. But, but look, he used his body weight and turned his hips, shoulders, and... It's quick, fast. You know, when that bat goes, that Babe Ruth, man, first of all, that ball is coming really fast. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen. I've, I've gone to professional. My son loved baseball. I never played it. But I went to some professional games with him. Though that ball comes so fast, man. Not only could I not hit it with a bat, I could barely be lucky if I even see that thing coming at me. <laughs> but he away. was yeah. able to. Babe Ruth, with, without all the muscles, it's not about muscles. Like, I think a lot of teaching goes like this. Van, well, I heard Van Dam say it. Van Dam says he can punch really hard because he does a lot of curls. He's got big biceps and triceps, and he, he builds his arms up. So him being not a professional fighter, I tell people, this is what's the problem if, if you try to endorse him as a world champion mm. kickboxer. It's like telling people, this guy's a medical doctor, mm. Mm. and he knows nothing about medicine. He knows nothing about health or diet. Or, and then people go to him and listen to his advice on what they should do about their health. It's dangerous. And I said, that's what Van Dam. Van Dam did an article where he said, you got to do a lot of curls and a lot of bench press, or not bench press, but, but a lot of uh, tricep extensions and work building like, muscles. Like yes. Small muscles. Yeah. Tries it. Oh, yeah. So that you would have hard punches. You could yeah. punch hard. And that's exactly the opposite of how I, I really it. teach it. Yeah, I believe that so. All too. of this has to be relaxed. Yeah. Now, there, it is true. If you're like Kimbo Slice, remember this, this guy? Who, oh, yeah, that he huge wrestled, guy. That's right. Yeah. He used arms. Now he stands there and he just th throws arm punches. Now after about, if he hits you the first 10 seconds, you can knock you out. But after about two or three minutes, he's ex totally wasted. He's never, he, I don't think the guy could ever punch a heavy bag for 12 rounds. Hard, I'm saying, you know, because he, he does everything wrong. Um, holding his breath, tightening his muscles. So there's a, not to say you can't throw a hard punch with tight muscles, but you're not going to throw... 12 rounds of it. I guarantee you that yeah. you're not going to tighten your muscles and throw 12 hard rounds of punches. You're going to be, you're lucky to get through one round, three minutes. If you tighten all your muscles, like uh, an inexperienced fighter would do. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I prefer teaching the lessons that I'm one of the few people who have the expertise to teach now, but people hire me to teach seminars all over the world. And, I was in Ukraine for uh, a week teaching seminars and every student was a kid because they felt I could motivate their, their youth. And they didn't really want me to get to, along with a bunch of young fighters and train them. They just wanted me to inspire their youth. And I yeah. got the, you know, um, the mentality of, I, I understand the, the, the conscious thought going into it was good. And, and, and I hope I did inspire them. You know, uh, I told them, be careful about which movies they watch because they're R-rated. <laughs> but um, you know, they, they, the kid, look, the 10-year-old kids didn't know who I was. But all the grandmasters and all the teachers, they, they all grew up watching my films. I'm so old in the martial art world now that I see a guy and he's like in his 50s. And when he was a teenager, when he was 16, 17, my movies were hitting the video stores. So he, when he was a kid... He was a big fan. Now he's got his own school. Some of them have, are old enough to have their own styles. You know, it's um, uh, a strange experience. But, um, you know, I've been around a long time now. <laughs> there's a, Quite a long time. Um, there's a, a great story about you as a bouncer. I believe in, in your first yeah, I, evening I started as a bouncer. My club. I was 18. Yeah. They, they pointed a gun at you in your first evening as a bouncer. So were you Very already doing night. any type of martial arts? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why, of course, that's why I want to be a bouncer. Was, uh, yeah, of you course. Know, yeah. I defend myself. <laughs> huh. and, and basically, listen, people don't go to nightclubs to fight the bouncers. Mm -hmm. They fight other people in the clubs. And so basically what you're doing is you're like a referee more than anything else. A referee that's got to stop the fights. 
And then because they might, you know, when your guy's drunk, he, he wants to beat up some other guy because maybe he made a pass at his girlfriend. He turns and throws a punch at the bouncer. Well, they're not as likely to do it because they know we were hired there for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're not wimpy kind of guys, bouncers. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying they all have to be black belt or kickboxing champions, but I'm just saying um, I was a pro kickboxer. I had had a few pro fights, and I was a point fighter. So, um, and I was a black belt. I, I was not a defenseless guy. And I, like I said, I, when I was in college, I wrestled for two years. So I could handle myself pretty well. And that, that was my job in college yeah. at the time. Part-time job working at, at, at the nightclub. But I mean, for the first night to have a guy, and that, by the way, that was the closest I've ever been to um, dying. Whoa. Because the guy that pointed the gun at me was point blank. And he was right up on me. And he was mentally ill. Mm. Now, I, other people have pulled guns on me and knives as a bouncer. But they did it not because they were trying to rob me or anything, they, because they were they were scared. When a scared guy pulls a gun, you know what you do? You do exactly what he asks you to do. He says, "Stop right there," or "or don't 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 come near me," or whatever they they're just scared. They're not trying to take your wallet. They're not trying to make kidnap you or. But they just they're scared. That's the other weapons that have been pulled on me: knives and and another gun was people were scared and then you just do what they say you say okay look just leave or whatever but this guy was mentally ill oh. and um yeah so we found no that out what the can police do. afterwards because he, he ended up they end up arresting the guy put him in jail but um yeah my first night i had a first of all i didn't know he had the gun i didn't see it basically he came up to the i was sitting on a chair in the front of the nightclub with by the way two under not undercover, uh, two off-duty policemen huh. and the owner of the nightclub. We're out in front of the club. The guy comes up and he's talking like crazy. And so we all kind of laughed. He said something that we thought was funny. And he looked really mad and he turned around and he started going to his car. When he went to his car, both police officers said not one word to me or the owner. They both went into the door of the club. They knew he was going back to get something. It would have been nice if the police officers had said, hey, uh, you guys probably better come with us because this guy's he might be going back to his car to get a gun. I, you know, he's pissed off. We pissed him off, and now he's going back to his car. He's not – the way he left was not like he was going to drive off. He must have said something threatening, and then when he head back to his car – but that just shows you, you know, they were looking after themselves. <laughs> I guess since they were off-duty, they had no responsibility to make sure I didn't get shot. Man, that's but anyway, so... yeah, he came back and pointed a gun at me, and um, – told me to sit down in my chair, which I did, proceeded to say a bunch of crazy stuff, got in his car and drove off. Later that night, the police ended up arresting him. Oh, but um, yeah, that's the closest I came. We wouldn't have any dragon stories right now because I was 18 years old, my first night in the job. Man. And I, I bet you the um, owner, I never asked him, but I'll bet you he didn't think I was going to come back the next night. <laughs> because when it happens your first night, you figure, man, this, what, what is this? This is a job where guns yeah, are going to be pulled this. on me. <laughs> screw you this. Know? Yeah. I'm just looking for a part-time job because I was in college at the time, right? So it's a great job because, you, you know, you, you don't get much sleep, you know, because you know, it's open until 4 a.m. Yeah. So screw this. I'm going to telemarketing or something. <laughs> no, but, you know what? I came back. I came back. It turned out to be a great job. I ended up becoming a bartender within a few months. And then I became the manager of the club. See and that? I was the youngest club manager. And by the way, that club, uh, Hulk Hogan used to play in a band. He used to play there. Really? And he had a quit. He liked the club so much. He quit. And I hired him as a bartender. Yeah. Hulk oh. Hogan worked for me. Now, what are the odds that the highest paid wrestler, and the highest paid kickboxer, because I was, when I came out of retirement, I got 150 grand plus 12% of the paper. Yes, I'm most any kickboxer has ever got. That we would work at the same nightclub. What are the odds of that? Wow. And and the thing is, when I fought in Japan, I fought for the same guy that promoted his wrestling matches. <laughs> then when I came to LA, Chuck Norris said, Don, you got to get an entertainment attorney. He gives me a name. So I go, I sign with this entertainment attorney. As I'm leaving his office, I look at the his wall, he's got a picture of Terry, is his name, Hulk Hogan up on his wall. I said, what's that up there for? And he said, that's one of my clients. We end up with the same lawyer in L.A. And when we worked together, it was in the man. 70s. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. odds, there are no odds because because it's, we worked in the same club. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I was the manager, he was a bartender there. And a lot of people thought he would be the, a bouncer, but no, he, he was not Hulk Hogan then. He was a tall, thin bass player in a rock band. 
Oh wow. He had the long hair. But um yeah, he when he here here's what happened it's with Terry. Um he opened up kind of like a gym during the day. He was running a uh, uh, like a like a gold's gym kind of thing, just free weights. So but he, wasn't he was not making used, any money. He wasn't huge already when he no had no no. But he he was he had he, he no. But he was getting bigger because he he had uh-huh. an interest in it. He owned his own gym. Yeah. And one of his friends from Tampa, you know, this was in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and he lived in Tampa before. His friend came and, and his friend tried out for wrestling and got accepted in this training program where they train you for you know six weeks or something and um you're in a trial period anyway he's this guy convinced terry to go try to be a wrestler so terry quit the bartending he went to try to be a wrestler and i believe he was called the destroyer but i'm not positive either, but he was a bad guy hmm. and he didn't make any money and nobody came to see him and he was, he was doing bad so he quit and he came back to work as a bartender and this is why i tell people if you want to do something don't give up when it gets tough talk now but but you know he's Still in Florida, I'm pretty sure. It's it's amazing that your life has been a roller coaster in in the terms in terms of uh, you being struck by such great stories around you as well, or really next to you. And I remember you being uh, also well, training with Bill Wallace, and he might have been he might have yeah. been a lot of what we were talking about, like the refinement of your technique. Probably he was the one to help I you with that as well. I learned the lead leg kicks from Bill. I learned the lead leg kicks from Bill. And, um, Which you mastered so I to well. LA, I love watching those. I love it. Well, I, I learned things from Benny Urquidez as well. So I oh. took Benny Urquidez. I trained in his gym when I moved to LA. Uh-huh. So I the took what center. I learned from Bill Wallace, what I learned from Benny, and I added it to my style. Mm-hmm. And then my own personal thing was, you know, I more than anybody, I believe the long distance running, that separated me. Because, you know, I won 48 fights by knockout. Well, here's an example. My last fight, I won in the last 10 seconds of the fight. I knocked the guy out at 48 years old. So, but my, so my conditioning, you may be able to go with me even for three rounds, four rounds, five rounds, six rounds. I might start to take the lead, but by round 12, you pro- you're going to be getting your rear end handed to you because <laughs> I won't even be breathing heavy when I was in shape. I'm saying. Not now, shoot! I I I I couldn't jog around the block probably, but when I, but that was one of my um, uh, things that separated me from the other kickboxers was my defense and my conditioning. You know, um, and, and I love whatever the level I can give you in the first round, I can give you that same level of aggression in the twelfth round. And you're and that's so not smooth. the norm. You know, most fighters degenerate every round; they get a little more tired, a little more tired. When I when I was in my prime, that did not happen. I love to watch you fight because you're so smooth. It's like everything flows. It's like it's so natural. It's not it's not like you're trying to go against yourself or trying to. It's not. It's explosive, but it's not. You know, nobody looks at you and say you're the most explosive guy. You're like you have it all. You have no, a little bit of everything. Like, I'm it's not like, Mike Tyson. It's so three dimensional. I love it. I love it. And your sidekick, man. Ugh. It hurts well, just to watch it. Tell people seventy percent, seventy percent of my offense and defense was a psychic. I use it defensively. I let guys throw the right hand, and when they throw the right hand, I lean back, and boom, I counter it with yeah. the psychic, and that may not knock them out, but it takes so much out of them. Within yeah. 35, 40 seconds later, I throw a combination, and they're on the floor. Now people don't realize they don't remember the sidekick hit them, you know, in the second round, in the third round. They only see the left hook or the right cross that knocks the guy down. They think it keeps that on damaging, was the knockout. Yeah. It's like a slow burner. Correct. But, it takes it out of you. you but know. it it's so you make it so long. I, I I love even you know you know which one's my favorite sidekick of yours <laughs> against John Cusack <laughs> on the movie Say Anything. Oh, that was in face. But you that, throw but... him a sidekick that I was like, oh my goodness, I hope that didn't connect. <laughs> <laughs> what, first what of a, all, first what of a all, huge reaction out of I him spar, as well. When I spar anybody, I do not. I spar. I know. I'm not trying to hurt my sparring partners. You know, of course. I would never throw that technique at anybody I because know. what if I landed? It's the bare. You know, we have foot pads on the top of our feet. The bottom, it's a bare foot. It, it's a heel. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hit any of my sparring partners in the face with my sidekick. 
Uh, Because there's no way to pull that. When I throw Mm -hmm. it, it's gone. And if they lean forward, it's going to hit them in the face. And I, I, I have a mean streak as a fighter, which just, it's not a mean streak. I finish guys. If I see that they're stunned, I move in really, I don't let them get off the hook. I, I, you don't get 48 knockouts by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what you're doing. I finish yeah. them. I, when you stun them, you finish them. And that doesn't mean I've got a Mike Tyson punch. You don't have to. If you hit the chin and they're stunned, it's like when you wake up in the morning, you, you kind of a little dizzy. If I walk up and I just go, I could, you'd yeah. be stunned. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you, I don't have to throw a big punch. I don't have to put my hip into it, my, my you know, my shoulder. And all. No, if you clip the chin, it, it's really what, one of the amazing things about fighting is how little force it takes to knock somebody out. Uh-huh. It doesn't yeah. take, unless you hit them on top of the head. I've seen Mike Tyson hit guys literally on top of the head, knock them out. Oh. Now that's a hard punch though. Jesus. You know, he's got a, a 10 ounce glove. He weighs 245 pounds of muscle. He's on every steroid that was ever invented. You know, <laughs> he's got every drug flowing through his system that jacks his testosterone up. And when he hits you on top of you, could be just like this. He could hit you on the forehead and knock you out. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> what I about think if the... you watch some of his fights? Because he punched, you know, a lot of guys say, "Well, how could I do against it's Mike like Tyson?" I said, "I get knocked right out." Hmm. He, I would, he would knock me right out. Uh, he would come at me. I would maybe land a leg kick, and he'd get inside, and that would be it. I, I could not. I'm talking about young Mike Tyson when he was 21. Yeah, it's it's too much. You power. put on it's 10 ounce force gloves. Force of nature. Mm. First of all, he was in great shape. Yeah, and he had head movement. They never talk about his defense, but you know, I, I'm a fighter that. It's all about defense. And. Mike Tyson had, he's fighting guys 6'6", six, six, they can't land a jab on him. Think about it. Yeah. He's, he was like six feet, if that, 5'11", six feet. And he's, his head movement is so good, they can't, they're six foot four, six, six, they can't land the jab on him. And then he moves right here, gets right on their chest. Now all their reach is a disadvantage. It's yeah. literally, it's, He's fighting there. That's his range. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, people used to ask me when, when he was in his prime, they said, well, what do you think you could do? I said, look, I, I, I could try to throw a few kicks, but I, I believe he'd get cl- close and I'd be, he'd put me out within 20 seconds. Do you believe he would you know, have done the same thing? Three, do you he believe would he would have three done... times on the way down. Do oh. so you believe What's he that? would have done the same thing to Muhammad Ali? Ali versus Tyson. Hard to bet against Ali because you know yeah. he's so smart. Um, here's what here's I met him one time, but here's what Ali I read everything about him because I'm a big fan. He said, I am the greatest, and he said, The reason I could say that is this anybody I fight 10 times, I'll win six out of 10. So he's not saying that Mike Tyson wouldn't catch him one, knock him out. Uh-huh. And I believe that because I believe he's a much smarter fighter than Tyson. Tyson has one way to beat Ali get inside, land the bomb. Ali can win many different ways, many, but yet but with the jab, may catch him with a right, tying him up, doing all. I, <clears throat> I yeah. think, yeah. If you look at it, I'm not saying that if they fight, it absolutely he's going to win because that doesn't. That's not the way you can, um, in, in my opinion, you can really establish who is the better fighter overall. One yeah, fight, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to ask you something, which is uh, um, we, we got to talk about the movies a little bit before I let you go. Uh, oh, Chuck yeah, Norris sure. got you started, or at least he gave you the idea of being a movie in the movie business. How did that come about? Well, sort of, sort of. Um, actually, what it is this. Other people had suggested it, but I didn't take it seriously. Because anybody can walk up to you and say, you know, you should be in the movies. But that doesn't... But when Chuck Norris, who you respect as a martial artist and actor, you know, that, that, that he was doing uh, movies for a company called Canon Films. So he was not... It was way before Walker, Texas Ranger. This was, I met him yeah. in the 70s. But he movies, and he was very successful. When he says, Don, I think you should try to be... Capitalize off your martial arts fame. Try to get in the movie business. You should move out to L.A., get an agent and try it. Then I took it seriously, you know, because he was in the business. And when he advised me, 
I, I took it more seriously. Everybody else, I just said, yeah, 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 maybe I'll be an actor someday, maybe, you know. But I didn't really think about it seriously. You know, I was a kickboxer. There's a lot easier ways to be an actor than fighting for 28 years as a kickboxer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That takes too much trouble. No, no, in no, other no. words, if you <laughs> ask me how can I become an actor, I wouldn't say, well, you need to start kickboxing. Start running six <laughs> miles every day, sparring, hit lifting weights, and travel around the world fighting everybody you can fight. And then after 20 years of that, go out to Hollywood and make, make your film career. What are, some of know, your it, it, what are your favorite movies that you've done? Blood Fist for sure. Uh, Red Sun Rising is one. Oh, Red, yeah. Well, Blood Fist Luke. because it was my first. Yeah, yeah, I got it, you know. Uh, but Red Sun Rising probably overall, it was the closest to me. Oh. So a lot of people were saying, oh, wow, you did a great job of acting. That one required very little acting. <laughs> it was about a half Japanese guy who dealt with prejudice. But it was just the opposite, though. Um, basically, he dealt with prejudice in Japan mm -hmm. because of his white blood. And um, anyway, so it was it was a character that I didn't have to wonder each scene how my character would react. Do you know that? Because that's what we have to do. And look, I'm not a character actor. In other words, I don't have to go way outside the boundaries of my normal self. And, you know, John Cusack is one of my good friends because, you know, ever since I trained him for Say Anything, And he said to me, he said, you know, Don, in the kind of roles you're going to do, these action movies, he goes, you, you can pretty much do the what if style of acting. And I go, what do you mean? He said, if you ever want to know how the character, how to play a character in a scene, just go, what if this happened to me? Mm. Because he knew being a, um, the leaning man, quote, I'm like the audience. I, I'm more like, I, I can't be the extreme guy. You know, I can't be the... Christopher Walken, weird guy. You know, I can't yeah, go to yeah. the Joaquin Phoenix, Batman, uh, uh, Joker kind of. Uh -huh. I don't go to the extremes. I, I surround myself with actors who do that. So those kind of characters may appear in my movies. But people don't expect it to be me. They expect me to be kind of like the everyday kind of guy, with, which I guess I must be. You are. You know, I, I, I believe you are. As, as, as an actor, I, I feel that as, as, as audience. You're... you're You're playing it cool, but in a way that's very believable. It's like uh, he is what he is. I mean, it's he's not yeah. over the top. He's not overreaching. You said the key no word, overacting at all. You just have to be believable. Yeah. Don't start with me, Johnny. I've seen you fight. It's not the same. I don't have to become Rain Man. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't have to become the Joker. And and then that's red, a different kind of acting, you know. Yeah. And, and then Red Sun Rising. I mean, having such uh, great actors to work with, like Mako. Mako was great. Well, right? listen, listen. It's it's they they compare it like this. You know, I did take acting lessons for many years. It's like playing tennis. If you get beyond Borg or Jimmy, you get some great tennis player. He can't show his best stuff if he's going against a high school kid. He mm -hmm. can't show it. Mm -hmm. He has the ability to go further, but he can't go further than his opponent, or his, yeah. the guy playing tennis with him. Now, as an actor, when I did Red Sun Rising, I'm working with experienced actors, all of them. I mean, Michael Ironside, Mako. Mako's an Academy Award nominated actor. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Mako. He's amazing. Ma, Ma, and he was great. You know, it was well written. First of all, Chris Penn is my best friend in L.A. Rest in peace, Chris. Yeah. But um, he said, Don, it, it's got to be on the page. And then you've got to have a director. Because I asked him, I asked him, how, how do you get better performance? How can I help myself get better performance? It's got to be in the script. Then it's the casting of the other person because they've got to bring it out of you. You know, he used to do movies. He worked with guys, the, the better shot. He worked with Christopher Walken. He worked with uh, Robert Downey Jr. He, when you work, he worked with Tom Cruise in all the right movies. It was a, like a high school football movie i love whatever. that i love that so movie yeah, i know the movie yeah a less level so if i was working at the a less a list level i i would look better my acting would would have to match them uh they would bring it out of me if you know what i mean you know um yeah. uh i'm not saying i can i can go look i i'm not i i had a director once he was trying to direct me in a scene i said look i'm not robert de niro <laughs> <laughs> i said i got about two or three ways i can I said, I got about two or three ways I can play this scene. Because <laughs> he wanted me to go out on all kinds of limbs and everything. And I said, look, I, I, I better if I just, you know, 
What was and the he looked at me. He, he's a director. He's a great director, by the way. He's very good. He he laughed and he said, "You know, Don, you're right. Just just come and do it the way you were doing it." <laughs> what was the toughest movie for you, or one of the toughest that might come to mind? Maybe Blood well, I can tell you that. No, um, it's a movie called. It's got two names. Because this was distributed foreign and distributed domestically by two different distributors. It was called Inferno and Operation Cobra. Huh. And I, it was shot yeah. in India. Mm. I shot it in India. And um, man, I, listen, I got nothing bad to say about the Indian people. I mean, it's just the conditions were so tough. It, it was the hottest part of the world, India, at the time, Madras, India. And the studio we were shooting in had no air conditioning. And I didn't know it, but that's the producer was from India. The reason why he picked that time to shoot there is he could get the studio cheap because no one else shoots then. All the Indian producers and actors and directors know we can't shoot during these months because it's way too hot. Look, imagine doing this. I, you got fans blowing, right? And I, I've got three shirts for every scene with action because they're going to be covered with sweat. I would do one take. It'd be covered with sweat. They'd take the shirt off, put it on the fan, then put a dry shirt on. I'd do the second take, take that, put it on. By the time I got to the third shirt, the, the other one would be dry. And I'd put it, and I did for six weeks. And um, that was the toughest movie to do. It wow. was, uh, yeah. look, everybody was sick. Everybody was getting, and when I say sick, it, it, you know, you, when you eat food, it's not, the food is great there, by the way. It's just that their water has organisms that we're not used to. And it's like uh, going to Mexico and getting um, Montezuma's Revenge, they call it. When their bacteria gets in your system, you just, you're sick. Yeah. <laughs> you can't keep anything down. Anything you do eat goes right through you. And um, yeah, we all got that. The female lead was named Tani McClure. Her father was Doug McClure. He's an actor in America. But anyway, she worked her scenes from a hospital bed. She was literally hooked to IVs to keep her hydrated. Then she would get in an ambulance. The ambulance would take her to the set. She would do her scene, get back in right the ambulance, the and hospital. go back to the hospital. Man. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was one of the actors, his name is Evan Laurie, came back. And I don't know if he got it there, but he came back to America and he started another film. It was a submarine movie. He was doing a scene in a submarine and he started feeling sick. And he passes out and they take, take him. He goes to Cedar sinai and he has a heart attack and they have to restart his heart. Oh, he God. had gotten, he said he had a whole sore, sore shoulder. I didn't talk to him, but this is what people told me. And he had the flesh eating bacteria in his shoulder. Oh. And um, they, they basically had to cut it all, all off. They did, you know, they don't, no antibiotics can, they, not his shoulder, but all the muscle that was infected had to be amputated. So like the, the like cut his arm in and half, mean, basically like a chip, got, chipped he away. He could have got it here in LA, but, oh but that's kind of scary. You know, that was Inferno. That was literally Inferno. Stat. That was a literal Inferno. <laughs> well, I never thought of it that way, but it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not nice to say, but uh, yeah, I actually, I, I got that impression right no, away. But he, well, I, look, here, here's how I got the news. I get a phone call late at night, too. You know, you don't direct. It was from the director of the movie. You don't get phone calls. It's not working hours like 1030. I get a call and the director says, hey, Don, uh, how's things going? I said, everything's going good. He said, well, how do you feel? And I said, what do you mean? He said, physically. And I said, I feel great. I said, why? why? What, what you? He goes, well, Don, I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but Evan is in the hospital. And I said, he's in the hospital for what? And he said, well, he's got the flesh eating bacteria and he, you know, he had a heart attack on the operating table and all that. And he said, if he, I said, well, what were his symptoms? And he said, well, he started feeling kind of like achy in his muscles. And as he's telling me the symptoms, I'm feeling them all over. <laughs> you know, my back feels kind of achy. Achy. He said, yeah, yeah. Is it like he was getting a little bit of cramp. I said, I think I got a, I, I got a cramp in my calf today. And I was every symptom he said, a little heat. I feel, I said, you know what? It feels a little hot to me. My arm feels kind of warm. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, it's 
shows you I'm very psychosomatic, you know, I guess. <laughs> As he's telling me the symptoms, I'm getting every one of them. Every, every one um, of them. Did you get that with COVID already? I got that with COVID like right away. It's like, oh, my God, I have COVID. Oh, my God, I have COVID. You know, before I was filming a movie when they started the travel bans, you know, Trump started the one in China and whatever. And they, uh -huh. they, they, eventually they stopped a lot of countries from coming. So we were shooting the movie in Almaty, Kazakhstan. And so the American actors, me being one of them, we said, listen, we got to leave. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I know I, I, I'm signed up to do this movie, but, but um, I got to leave because they're going to shut me down and I have to live in Kazakhstan. I said, I got to get back to the America. So they did. The, the producer said, okay, fine. We shut everything down, flew back to LA, and then we've been in lockdown all this time. And, and now my wife is a makeup artist. She has a TV series. She does TV. That's why we don't work together anymore. But uh, she's, her TV shows back online filming. So I believe we're going to start the movie again. And the producer is telling me he's going to try to make it to where my scenes can be finished in L.A. So we'll, we'll be mm -hmm. trying to find fake places that look like Kazakhstan. Because I, I shot a bunch of stuff in Kazakhstan already. And the movie is supposed to take place. But, but um, you know, I don't know when it's it, going to be. But yeah. that, that's... You know, yeah. but that's that's where we stand now. Is is I got to finish that movie, and then people ask me, "Do I have projects coming up?" And you know, I've got movies and things. People are always talking about scripts and things. And but my real heart is in TV. Oh. And I, I throughout my career, I've been offered four TV series, mm -hmm. and um, uh, one I said no to. I I, I myself I didn't want to do it, and um, one they canceled. They, they well not canceled. They just decided to do it without me. <laughs> so they canceled me out of that series. Shot in Hawaii, by the way. But And then the other two, one is the Trump trade war with China because it was supposed to shoot in Beijing. It's basically the, uh, a Chinese producer named Henry Luck bought the rights to Blood Fist from Roger Corman oh, to do a TV okay. series. Oh. So I was going to have to film in, in Beijing. But because of the trade war, that got stopped. And now oh. because of the pandemic... What actors want to go over there? Everybody's scared, you know, mm. uh, scared. And and the, the other one is in Almaty for Netflix. It's a series would be for Netflix. And um, they're all on hold now because of the hold. pandemic. So, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're – and, and really, while I have some film offers – and I've, I've got a script that I'd like to do. It's my version of The Expendables, but with a twist because the twist is uh, we're a group of former SWAT unit guys that are retired. And we have to fight a bunch of vampires. <laughs> so it's not like the That's Expendables huge fighting vampires. You know how <laughs> yeah. it'd be like the Expendables going in and, and fighting Predator. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, a yes, crossover. So all the B-movie karate guys are all written into it. So Expendables is all the A-list guys all in uh -huh. one. I mean, you got uh -huh. Jet Li and Dolph and Arnold and, and Statham, Bruce Willis, and, uh, Schwarzenegger, and Harrison Ford. Antonio Banderas, everybody. Van Damme was in it, right? Yeah. Well, this is going to be the same way, except uh, this, it'll be, we're going to be fighting vampires. So that puts a twist on it, you know? And, and I found this out because I did a vampire movie way before Blade, before Wesley Snipes did it. Uh -huh. I did a movie called Night Hunter. Night Hunter, and yeah. And Night Hunter, I remember you, know, you, watch it, you can watch them on YouTube. They're on YouTube. They're yeah. free. People just post them. Uh -huh. um, it was before Blade. I was the first martial artist to use kicks and punches and stuff against uh, against vampires. Vampires, mm -hmm. yes. And um, uh, this one, basically, this this uh, since I'm older, I'm a trainer at the SWAT unit or at, at the uh, police academy. But I was a head of a SWAT unit, so I've got some of my guys that were doing a drill with some young cadets. And there's a terrorist attack downtown LA, so we all go into the police station. The real SWAT unit goes to handle the terrorist attack, but it's not a real one. It's a staged one because there's actually a bank robbery in progress. And we get the hostages taken. So there's the SWAT unit's not there. They're, they're all trying to take care of the um, uh, terrorist attack at downtown L.A. So we load up a van and we go there to rescue these hostages in the bank robbery. And we chase the bank robbers into a building. When we get in the building, the building's full of vampires. Wow. And... So what ends up happening is the SWAT unit and the bank robbers join forces to fight. Okay. Because now it's humans versus vampires. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And as bad as the bank robbers are, Nothing they're badass. Because they're all going to... 
both groups are going to be um, like the SWAT units going to be all us B movie guys. Michael Dudikoff, Richard Norton, Cynthia Rothman. But the bank robbers are also going to be um, B movie actors oh, that you've seen. You know, it's a very uh, um, it's a very attributed story uh, or plot line. Well, I ripped it but off. But it's all in the Tarantino. execution, which I'm sure you guys can oh, pull no, it off. Oh no, the, the action. It's the all in the execution. Good. Yeah. Correct. And the thing is this: the Quentin Tarantino did a movie called Dust It On. Uh huh. That movie starts off with uh, a bank robbery happens, something happens, and they try to go to Mexico. And it's a normal movie. There's nothing that would ever tell you it's a horror film. <laughs> then the last scene, they're in a bar, and at midnight, all the people in the bar turn into vampires. Okay. So you this want is that the same way. This you is want a that kind of twist. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. It's a norm. There, nobody's going to be. There's no tongue in cheek. There's no comic relief. There's no. It's a normal movie until until we get in that building, and it's like Predator. We're going through, and I'm talking to guys on the, and then one guy's not answering. I go, "What the hell happened?" And we find his body there, and his arm is torn off. And do you remember when Schwarzenegger in the Predator? He goes, "Gorillas don't do, that. you know, uh, these guys <laughs> oh, don't, don't do this." The you know, the guys, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I think they were fighting gorillas. You know, some some. But they've got, the guys were skinned. Whatever it is out there, it killed Hopper. And now it wants us. And this is going to be the same way. We're going to find guys, a cop dead. And his arms are ripped off. His head's chopped. Or something. You know, it's going to be something that these vampires did. That so it's like robbers don't bank do Bank robbers don't do. <laughs> don't do this. Right. When you rob a bank, you shoot the cop. Look, he was shot. He's already dead. Why would they pull his head off? Why would they tear his arm? You know, it's, and, the, and the bank robbers, same way. And um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a good script. It's a good script. It was written by a guy, by the way, that um, uh, he was a TV writer. He wrote for a TV series. And he, he contacted me and he said he always wanted to do, he's a martial artist as well as TV writer. Mm -hmm. He said he always wanted to do an action film, but he never got the opportunity. I said, look, I got an idea about doing this vampire movie. I just pitched it to him, the basic idea, and he gave me the script back. and It was really yeah. good. I it. Hey, you and that. Um, so far, it, I've been offered to produce it twice by producers. First one offered a certain amount of money and... I've never made a movie for that little money and I didn't want to take a chance because, you know, this for me, this is going to be a big money maker. Mm. I think it could be sequels to it. I certainly it's believe so. It's and, blood I, rate. and I think there's being a lot of uh, um, subculture of, of the B movies and the martial arts movies. And the, now you got Scott Atkins doing also a great podcast with with a lot of, of the, the, the action stars. So I believe there's going to mm -hmm. be a little bit more research in terms of those those movies that well, uh, a lot of us grew up watching uh, for the youngsters. Bringing right things now. back is not a bad thing like a Karate yeah, Kid. Exactly. The old fans, of course, we like it, but the yeah. new people watching it, You know, also the newer kids, because you can't just count on the old fans. You know, you got to have new fans. Exactly. And um, yeah, and it's uh, great stories. But I, but when it's a great story, it works. Work, you know? Yes. When, when it's yeah. a great story, and, and it I, works. I believe, I believe in this one. I, I, you know, it's not gone with the wind. It's not Academy Award nominee. Exactly. So yeah. I'm not expecting <laughs> to get any awards. My films don't get awards, but they make a profit. You know, I tell people I've got a better record as an actor than I do as a fighter. And they go, what do you mean? I said, I'm profit. 30 and 0. I started 30 films. They all made a profit. <laughs> Now, very few actors can say that, that every yeah. single movie they started. Now, of Who course, they don't make that? the movies as low budget as mine. Mine are very low budget. And so, so the bar is not set way up there. It's not, I don't have to gross 100 million. Great million margins. Profit. You should go yeah. on Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. So, uh, uh, Well, uh, look, you know, I was trained by... Uh, I did 12 movies with Roger Corman, and they call him King of the B movies. Mm -hmm. And um, he really taught me how to make these movies fast and cheap as possible. And, um, you know, we get, when I get a named good actor, um, I pay him one, for one day, and they can end up throughout the whole movie. Mm. Because I have a camera and a crew and everything just for their shots. And, um, yeah, I... I did that for a movie I did for the Sci-Fi Channel. It's called The Last Sentinel. 
But anyway, we had a we had an actor. I don't want to say his name because he only worked a couple of days, but he's throughout the whole movie, and that that that's the way you have to do it. He would have been way too expensive if he had to work, um, you know, two weeks, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. But to come in for one day, and all his stuff is done in one day. Matter of fact, we put the thing in his ear, so he didn't even have to memorize the lines. You know, he just we would give him. You could feed him the lines. The um, to he could hear them. And so he's an A-lister, and you used him for, to get a little bit more credibility yeah, or yeah, to boost well, up the, well, he, the, the listen, movie. Yeah, he okay. was in the movie that won the Academy Award. He he was in uh, Crash, one of the oh. actors in Crash. Yeah, and and hmm. the movie Man. Last Sentinel was is no Academy Award. <laughs> but it, but it was good for the yeah. Sci-Fi Channel. They okay. they really liked it and uh, performed really well. The Last Sentinel. You're not big on the whole personality thing are you uh, i would love to finish with just quick fire questions uh to, to, to get you know uh, know you a little better it's been an hour and i don't know an hour and a half so we're gonna wrap this up oh, I, I don't but, even know <laughs> which sound or noise yeah. do you hate that is the first question hmm. um a sound that i hate uh yeah i think the same one everybody hates you on know, the scratching of the <laughs> Of the board. chalkboard, the chalkboard, you. And I, you know, I haven't heard it since I was in high school, probably. But I mean, that, that's kind of a sound you don't like. <laughs> Stuck I with mean, you. Just... What? What is your favorite word? Win. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Least favorite word. Uh, yeah, well, 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 when you're a fighter, you got a win-loss record, right? You, yeah. I don't know. Winning is. What is your least favorite word? Lose. <laughs> Yeah, I think might as well stick with my theme. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What what what's the best food for you? Food. Uh, which food? What type of food do, do you like? Romaine lettuce. Romaine lettuce. I eat complete. Really? I eat complete bowls of it. I, I when I was at the boxing gym training, you know, the, the, the guys in there are, are like twenty. They're in their teens. And they go, Mr. Wilson, what do you what, what do you have for lunch? Because look, when I go in the gym, I look at the clock, not the buzzer. You know, three minutes on, one minute rest, three minutes on. And I just punch the bag and kick the bag for like 45 minutes, 50 minutes, wow. you know, an hour. I don't go three minutes and then. So I'm, I'm doing it like an aerobic exercise. So these guys, they're 18 years old. They can't do that. And so they that's go, your type of workout right now? That's what you do right now? Them, gonna, yeah, right now. Okay. Right now. Yeah. And I, I run at the park six miles. I run around the park. It's 0. 0.6. I run 10 times around the park. Shadow boxing and, and you know, I, it's not just, I'm not a runner. I'm not a long distance runner. I'm a fighter, so I do it like a fighter does. Yeah. You know, I, I'll go sideways. Yeah, I'll, do, I'll speed up, sprint a little bit. Yes, it, it's it's a it's too boring the other way. Anyway, just yeah. the same thing. And I wear headsets with music, so when the music picks up, you'll see me pick up when I'm running. But but anyway, um, but I'll eat and a hell, whole head. I've got Roman a big bowl. Lettuce. I'll eat the entire meal is just the lettuce. I make a Caesar salad out of it. Wow. And, um, okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is in there, but I, something I, I like crave, crave. And then I throw in sunflower seeds. I, I mean, I throw in raisins. I make it a, it's kind of a weird thing. You know, whatever I have around the house <laughs> it ends up going in there. You throw it and there. it's not in a bowl, it's in a big container. You know, it's one of those bowls that you use to nice. make food. Oh, food that whatever. is certainly very and healthy. So, uh, what are your favorite movies? Some of your favorite movies. Uh, mine. In general, in general, the in one general. I made. No, no, other than your. But own. not the one. Oh, Enter the Dragon would be one that I couldn't top for when it comes to fight act. Well, well, not the way of action was shot because Bruce Lee was really the stand. I, it, it was Bruce Lee, you know. So, yeah, so Enter yeah. the Dragon. Um, and other than martial arts movies, do, what, what type of DVDs do you pop up, or I don't know, if you if you if you are to watch a movie, where are you gonna watch? On a Saturday um, night. Oh. I like sci-fi's. Mm -hmm. I watch sci-fi's. I, 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 when I'm running, when I run out of sci-fi's, there are movies that I've seen over and over and over, uh, like War of the Worlds. I watch, you know, oh. uh, just, just all the big budget ones, and and even I watch. Um, film shorts made by film students. Mm -hmm. I watch, you know, time travel ones or, um, you know, um, 
just very science fiction. Okay. I tell you, I saw one the other night on a fluke, and and I, I about two nights ago, I woke up for no reason at like two in the morning, I turn on the TV because I can't sleep, and I go to HBO and they're playing a thing called I believe it was called Contagion. Oh, and it's one. exactly yeah. it was made back in the 2000s it's about a monkey that gets a virus that gets into people oh yeah 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 uh, everybody was posting that back. movie because of the of the, of the covid and they, yeah they wore the masks and and <laughs> it, was, it was like what we're going through now you know so when politicians tell you nobody could have predicted this <laughs> Hollywood screenwriters predicted it 10 years ago yeah over 10 years ago there was contagion so before they didn't know scientists didn't know <laughs> yeah it's like, 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 like we could nobody could have predicted this would happen that's like when uh, remember when 9 11 happened and Bush said nobody predicted that they could use planes as weapons but yet the Israelis had security people on every airplane of course they knew that the mentality of a terrorist was to die with the, you know, they they would die in the process of getting their, yeah, revenge, their or whatever. ideals, their revenge, uh, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. They, well, listen, the Japanese uh, pilots were not given enough fuel to attack the Americans because they, they they did some sneak attacks because the Americans thought, well, we're out of range, they they don't have enough fuel to come and go back, so they Americans wouldn't send our pilots, right? We would never do that. We mm -hmm. wouldn't send a pilot to attack a ship if we knew it was so far away. They couldn't make it back, back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final question. Final question. What other career besides yours would you have liked to try? So none of those that you were talking about. Engineering. Because that's what I it was my major. And I liked it then. I, I did like it. And I, I I was on my way to become an, uh, an engineer. And I would be working at the best place in the world, which was Kennedy Space Center, because that's where oh. my dad worked. He was at NASA. And he worked for McDonnell Douglas there. And I, so I had the end. You know, you can't get it. I just had to go through two more years of school, graduate. My dad would have hired me, and I'd be working at the Space Center. And yeah. that was the place to be because Kennedy was the president at that time. Uh -huh. And um, when I was a kid, a little kid. And, um, you know, he put all the emphasis on the space program. Instead of, we didn't have a uh, um, uh, an arms race. We had a space race. Russians were trying to beat us to the moon, and we were trying to beat them to the moon. And yeah, that was the know, main focus um, back then until 1969. Yeah, that was that was my growing up in the 60s. Yeah, uh -huh. and my uh -huh. dad worked at the space center, so so that was the other career I was. If if I had not been a, um, but I can tell you this: what would have happened was this: I would have been very bored. <laughs> I wouldn't have had as much. I fun. thank God Almighty that you did not do it, because otherwise we probably wouldn't be here talking. Because I I can't talk to an engineer. What am I well, going to say to him? <laughs> there would never been no. There would been never been a sidekick. That was exactly. Right. That's my main exactly. Thing. Hey, I, so you know what I got? On the, this is what's going on right here with me. Oh, now. can you? Well, is that oh, Sandy sorry? or is that Sandy or what's the name of the other one? Joy. Sandy. Sandy. That's Sandy. This is. Is she licking your your leg. <laughs> what time is it? Do you have the time? Do you have the time? Uh, what little, time is it? I think so. Wait, wait, wait. I, I have the Portuguese time. I have no idea. So it's. I don't have it on here. my phone. It's one fourteen a.m. here, so it's probably you guys have eight hours less. So you're the engineer. You do the math. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have well, no idea. I, well, you know what? We started at three. Five. Her dinner time. Five fifteen is um six, so it's five. So it's it's close. It's five fifteen. It five fifteen. She thinks it's dinner time. No, she's okay, trying okay. to tell me. I'm letting you off the hook. She's I just want to say something. Thank you so much for this. This was an incredible ride, and uh, I also wanted to what? say that uh, you got me to tears uh, today. Mm. Yes, it was today because I saw one of your latest fights, I believe, with a guy called Branco, and one of the people in the audience. Oh yeah. And one of the people Bronco, in the audience yeah. was Chris Penn, and he was like crazy. Yeah. When you beat up the guy, when you KO'd him, he was like, bah, ha, ha, ha. he was so happy. There was uh, Stephen Vincent Lee next Look, to him. Now he was my best friend. Exactly. Wilson, a left to the body. Oh! 
put on the road. Second trying to buy time. And Wilson really mad. Wilson picking his spot. Uppercut. He's got Sikatich really into the corner. Over the top. They throw in the towel. It's over. It's over. So I saw that and I was like, man, I, it, it got me to tears to thinking of what happened, obviously, with him uh, uh, going I was down the, last the bad guy to road. Talk to him. Oh, Jesus. And uh, I, well, I, talk, I talked to him. I called him. I, basically, Sean made me the um, uh, lead pallbearer at his funeral. So the last thing I did was I carried his mm. coffin to the graveyard. Mm -hmm. um, and he said he checked the phone records and I was the last guy he talked to. So everybody wanted to know what was his mood. And I said he was in the best mood since I'd ever, since I've known him. And they, they, they said, why? And I said, I was on a movie set doing a movie. And I got a producer that was working with me. He was so happy with the way my movie was going that I told him about Chris's pet project. He had a, a movie that he had already written the script to that he had to direct, but nobody would finance it. Mm -hmm. it it's a, a Vietnam movie, but it, not a war movie though. It's, a, it, it's about a Vietnam soldier who has a daughter in Vietnam he doesn't know about and just finds out he has to go back and, and get her out of Vietnam. But anyway, yeah. I got the producer to say he would finance Chris's movie. So I didn't care, it was late at night, but I didn't care because I called him up to tell him the good news. I said, I, I got the money for his movie that he had dreamed about. He wrote it when he was in high school, the first draft. So that's how long he's been wanting to make this movie. Oh, wow. And um, I, so he was in the best mood of his life. And he hung the phone up and he died that night in bed. Oh. Had a heart attack. Now, wow. people ask me, well, what, was it a drug overdose? I said, no, it was a combination of things. He weighed 310 pounds. He had gotten fat, eaten bad food. Mm -hmm. He was an alcoholic. So he's drunk every day and he had the flu. So I know this, his doctor prescribed him a codeine based cough suppressant. He was, and he, Chris doesn't put it in a spoon and measure it. He would just take it and guzzle it. And, do, and I, I know that he over, he took too much. He was tired. He had been working all day. He was telling me he was exhausted and everything. He loved the great news. So I, it was a combination of things. Yeah. And yeah. he did abuse drugs. He did a lot of cocaine in the 80s. And yeah. what that does is it damages your heart. Yes. He had an yes. enlarged heart from the cocaine. So it was a combination of things. And then that's why he died. That, that, and I tell people, it, I learned a life lesson, though. If you have something you want to do, don't put it off. Because nobody's guaranteed the next day. You know, the Chris wanted to make this movie his whole life since he was in high school mm -hmm. and um he finally got a chance but he didn't he yeah. didn't live long enough to make this movie that he wanted to do and um yeah it was sad day and, and me and charlie sheen were um you know he introduced me to charlie with you know, i met chris and charlie sheen the same day but um we went to his grave the year afterwards because you know there was a funeral and everybody was there but the year afterwards his closest friends got together and we went back to the funeral and we uh, said a secondary goodbye to Chris. And um, yeah, it's- um, Just you guys, yeah, that's amazing, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, anyway, but, uh, yeah. What a great what a great advice and what a great message uh, to finish with because that's what's most important. Don't put things off, yeah. It's some, some positive um, talk from uh, the dragon himself. So thank you so much, sir, once again. I'm so glad we did this, and uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. Like I said, I forgot. I lost track of time. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So, and, 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 you know, this is not my normal interview anyway. You you have a different style and different questions. and um, I, I, prefer and to, I, 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 I prefer to see it as a talk, you know. I love the talk aspect of it. I love you being here and answering the phone and then coming back to the qu I mean it's a, it's a real conversation between two human beings. It's not it's not just everything all edited. I like to be a little bit well, raw. What? Well, it's um li live. This would be live. Live. Phone calls, dogs. <laughs> uh, yeah, this would be a, a live um kind of broadcast. So but it I does have that. that element of surprise. I love yeah. that. And, and you know what me, I just noticed you got Bruce Lee right behind you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. You got Bruce course. Lee right behind you, yeah. Yeah. Just noticed it, just noticed it. Yeah, see, uh, check it but out. Anyway, this, thank you. This and, is my uh, studio. Say hi to Sandy for me. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Thank you, <laughs> bye-bye. See you, Don, thank you so much. See you soon.